I am Kendara Blake, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Doctorow. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Kendara Blake. It's episode 245 of the Author Stories Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Before we get into our awesome interview today, I'd like to tell you about some sponsors. If you would like to sponsor the show and highlight your product or service to our audience, go to hankgarner.com and click on the advertised link at the top menu. Thanks to Daniel Arthur Smith and Tales from the Canyons of the Damned. This 19th issue of Tales from the Canyons of the Damned consists of five sharp, suspenseful, thought-provoking short stories, each from a different featured master of speculative fiction. Pick up the Halloween edition today. The Future Chronicles by curator and publisher Samuel Peralta. The Future Chronicles has grown from a single collection of robot stories into a series whose unique take on major science fiction and fantasy themes, AI, aliens, time travel, dragons, telepaths, zombies, immortality, galactic battles, cyborgs, doomsday, has made it one of the most acclaimed short story anthology series of the digital era. Pick up something from the Future Chronicles today. Third Scribe is a web platform built to serve all members of the book community, readers, authors, and publishers. Third Scribe can help you get the most out of your publishing and reading experience. Connecting readers and writers, give thirdscribe.com a look today. From book one of the Paragons trilogy by C. Stephen Manley, When Dark Portals Open, Heroes Will Awaken. Israel Trin is a man living his dream as a crime reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Aaron Sims is a young woman whose life is a blur of neon lights, drug-fueled diversions, and being in the wrong places with the wrong people. These two strangers wake up together in a modern-day dungeon with no memory of how they got there and come face-to-face with monsters that neither ever dreamed existed. Rescued by agents of the mysterious Sentry Group, the duo soon find their lives turned upside down. Awaken is the first book of the Paragons trilogy. It's a gripping origin story filled with mystery, fast-paced action, horrific threats, and bewildering fringe science. If you enjoy an action thriller with a heavy dose of the fantastic, you'll love C. Stephen Manley's Awaken. Essence, book one, Septima, series by Nick Breaker. Troy, with his irrational fears, is the least likely person to lead a war. But that doesn't mean he can escape his destiny. A trip to New Orleans turns into something much larger when aliens kidnap him and his friends. A perfect doppelganger for their dead General Tomas, Troy is thrust into the front lines of battle against Reptar and Evaders. As he struggles to maintain control of his own destiny, Troy knows that no matter the outcome, his life will never be the same. Explore the mind of this unlikely hero in essence, the first book in a new sci-fi series by Nick Bricker, a coming-of-age tale full of adventure and steamy encounters. Pick up Essence, book one, by Nick Breaker today. Music City Macabre by Bob Williams is some of the best action, adventure, horror you'll ever read. Music City will never be the same as you have a front row seat for the end of the world. Give this series a look today. Music City Macabre by Bob Williams. Stay tuned after the show for an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Kendara Blake on the show. If you like dark fantasy, you're going to love Kendara's books. Uh, Welcome to the show, Kendara. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm I'm happy to have you. Uh, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, uh, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh, oh, that's tough. I I get the feeling that I don't have as strong a memory as other people when it comes to my childhood. Like, I don't think I started really forming the memories that last until I was about eight. Um, and I know I was reading for far longer than that. So I don't really know. I mean, I, I've been my mom took me to the library every week in the summer. We didn't have a ton of money and. So that's how I learned to read. And I imagine that it was all that reading that kind of led me just down the path of you read so many other people's stories and it kind of it feels natural to start creating your own. 
Right. Uh, what sort of stories really fascinated you or the first ones you can remember? When I was a child, I know that it was unicorn books. Okay, so that that memory that memory is 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 fully formed because I can actually remember a few of those unicorn books. You you said the the first books that that really stick out in your memory were unicorn books. Uh, what, what was it about them? Do you think? I don't know. I think I was a typically horse crazy girl. Um, I always wanted a horse. I actually eventually we did move to a hobby farm and I was able to get some horses. So that was probably where that came from. Nice. Uh, was that something that you that you kept up? Uh, were you an avid reader as you became an adolescent and got into school and, and all of that stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I never really stopped reading. The actually actually the time that I did the least amount of reading was in college. <laughs> Ironically. Because I, you know, you read so many textbooks and at the end of the day, if I looked at one more word, I was going to scream. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, speaking of college, what did you major in? For my undergrad, I majored in like corporate finance. So um, studying to be like a stock analyst or, you know, currency trading or something like that. Like so nothing related. Fantasy, like you do when you want to be a fantasy writer. Right. We should all have that background. It it really helps with the wizardry and stuff. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, that was your undergrad degree? That was my undergrad. And for my grad school, I did study creative writing. But to be honest, that was really just an excuse to go live in London. Oh, nice. Uh, so you, you went to school for finance. Uh, at any point, did you uh, know that uh, that you wanted to pursue writing? Uh, you know, before you went for your for your finance degree, was that ever an inkling in your mind? I always knew. I was always writing. And, um, you know, even back then before college, I was kind of trying to get things published, but it wasn't there yet. I wasn't ready. But I just I didn't feel confident that I could make a living off of it. And at the time, I, I didn't want to live with my parents forever. But after graduation, I mean, I, I really hated that finance crap. I really did. I really hated it. And uh, after a couple of, you know, just a few years, really, I just called my parents. And I'm like, hey, so I'm going to quit my job and, and go study in London for a writing. And you're okay if I live with you forever, yes? And they were like, yes, come home. Your room's just how we left it. So, And you're like, that's a little creepy, guys. You should have done something I know. with the room before now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, married and live across the country and they would still like welcome me back with casseroles and cake. They're just those kind of parents. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always fascinated, uh, with kind of the, the journey that people take to get to, uh, to writing. And so many times, uh, you know, people pursue other, um, uh, other paths and, and other careers and, and the writing just won't leave them alone. You know, we, we think, well, you know, uh, writing may not, uh, may not be something I could pay the bills with and I need to be responsible and get a good responsible job. And finance seems like a great responsible thing to do. And, uh, but the, the muse just won't let you go. Uh, what was the awakening moment for you when you decided to, you know, go uh, pursue creative writing? I think it was just I had spent um, enough time in an office building and I, I had just figured it out. Like, I can't I can't do this for the rest of my life. And if I'm going to make a run at this writing thing and see if I can make it work, I should do it while my parents are still willing to let me come back. That was that was my thought process. Uh, what was it about London? What, what drew you there? I've always wanted to live in London. I don't know why. I just, I think it's the coolest city. And the minute we touched down there, I, I went with another friend of mine who also needed to go to graduate school. Um, and the minute we touched down, we're like, oh, we're home. This city feels like home. What was the, uh, what was the creative writing program? Where was it? What school? It was, it was at a campus of Middlesex University. Um, it was actually a gorgeous campus in northern London, just on the outskirts, almost in the countryside, uh, set on, like, they'd converted an old mansion estate into classrooms. So, like, we had our classes in converted mansion rooms and converted stable houses, and it was really cool. How cool. 
Uh, there was, was like a pond full of swans. Like that's how cool it was. Oh, uh, like total fairy tale stuff. Total fairy tale. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the, the college experience like for you? So you'd been through uh, school, got a finance degree, worked in, in corporate America, and then you're back in school and in creative writing, and not only there, but in, in London. Um, kind of w- walk me through a little bit what was going through your mind and, uh, you know, did were, were the possibilities opening up to you that, you know, this, this is something I can do with my life? It was really exciting, honestly. Um, Undergrad was mostly pressure and freaking out and being really young and out of the nest for the first time and acclimating to so many different life changes. But in graduate school, I, I knew I was there just to kind of live out a dream. So I really just went for it. And it was completely, you know, immersive, just 100% focused on reading, focused on writing, and that's all we were talking about. That's all we were thinking about. Um, yeah, it was a completely different experience. Uh, what do you think one of the uh, the best lessons uh, was that you learned at the creative, creative writing uh, course that you took? Oh, gosh, I learned so much. Um, I learned, I mean, I'd, I'd been trying to land an agent before that. And actually, I had already written the novel that would eventually become my first published novel. But uh, my members there taught me a whole lot more about the process. They hooked me up with a literary agency in London that I was able to do some work experience with and get kind of an an inside view on what the day-to-day workings were uh, from that side. And that was fantastic. Um, It just, it was the first time I'd ever intensely studied writing and thought about writing in that way. I kind of had a fear that it would kind of take the, the magic out of it for me. Like, like learning to be a, a magician or something. Like, if you know how they're pulled, then it would be as fun to be in the audience anymore. But that was probably just a, that was just a dumb fear. Right. Well, I think we all do that because, uh, you know, especially those of us that, uh, that like particular kinds of books and, and you love to be uh, immersed in the story and it almost feels like magic sometimes like uh, like I don't know how the author pulled this off but I don't want to leave the setting I don't want to leave these characters when it's over and I really right. don't want to know how the sausage is made because it's going to take I... something away from it <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> I don't want to think about it too much yeah yeah absolutely um, so that first book that you got published uh, was that Anna Dressed in Blood no, um, actually, it was a small, small novel called Sleepbox Society, uh, published by a tiny press store. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was very, very, very indie. And it, it did what indies do. But it was great working with them. And it was a fantastic experience. But I still I mean, I for the most part, I still consider Anna to be my debut novel. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, but you said that Sleepwalk Society, you'd written that before uh, going there. What what did you um, what did you learn there that uh, or, or or maybe you didn't did you uh, did you ed- re-edit it and kind of reshape the book uh, after being in the course there? No, um, I think that actually the publisher who did end up finally picking it up had had it since before I was on the course. I mean, sometimes when you're working with small presses, it just takes that long to get a response. So it was, it was probably like a year and a half later that they emailed my then agent who had then left the business, uh, if to see if it was still available. And she, you know, kindly passed that email on to me and that's how that got started. But for whatever reason, when I was on the course in London, that's when my work started selling. And I don't know why I'd like to think I just improved, um, in some way, but that's when I started finally selling short stories where after 10 years of rejections on short stories and that's when the novel finally came together and nice. yeah, that's where it started. What, uh, were, had you been writing short stories for, for a while uh, at that point? Mm-hmm. Short stories were probably the first thing that I'd seriously been writing. Uh, when I was in high school, I did this collection of short horror stories with the guy that I was dating at the time. Um, and I, I'd always found short stories to be a lot of fun. And they're one of my uh, favorite things to read, actually. Uh, I wish there were more, I wish there were more single author short story collections. I, 
I know. Uh, Hugh Howie and I were talking about that uh, the other day. Uh, he had a new uh, short story collection come out with uh, stories of, of just his, and we were talking about that very thing and and how, um, I you know, I don't want to say short stories are underappreciated because there's a, a a big market and I think the market's even growing now for that. Uh, but you know, people people love novels, and you think of an author, you want to know what novels they've written, and the short story is such a fantastic vehicle uh, to to do all sorts of crazy stuff with. I agree, and they don't because uh, there is that stigma around a short story, like, oh, you're a really successful short story writer. Well, when are you going to write a novel? Exactly. Like, why do you have to do anything but write these amazing short stories? They're perfectly worthy, and they're just as hard, if not harder. Um, than than writing a novel. Um, also, in young adult, they they don't tend to do very many young adults uh, single author short story collections. I can only really think of Holly Black's The Poison Eaters and other stories, and that's about it. We do a lot of anthologies, uh, lots of authors coming together on a single topic, but no, I would like to see more of that. I would too. I wonder why that is. Do, do they just think that the YA market can't support it or, or won't support it? Yeah. I, I don't understand. Yeah, they that. say they don't sell. That's crazy. I mean, I don't know. I don't know about Holly Black's, but she's you know one of the biggest names in YA, and maybe hers didn't even perform that well. But I thought it was amazing. Really showed off her versatility. You know, she really flexed different creative muscles, um, and eventually it it spawned one of her best novels, The Coldest Girl in Cold Town, was was an offshoot of one of the short stories in the poison eaters. Nice. Well, that sounds like a challenge for some marketing people to figure out how to, to get uh, this form out to a wider audience and, and help people appreciate it more. Yeah. Well, they say that even the, the anthologies don't necessarily do that well financially, but it's a great opportunity for different publishers to work with writers from across the board, not only writers that they have in house. Right. Right. So, well, yeah, it is what it is, I guess. We we yeah. love the short story though. So yeah. <laughs> so you were you were writing those, you started getting some of those stories placed, um, and then uh of course you got your, your early novel uh placed. And tell me about how Anna Dressed in Blood uh came about. Okay. Well leading into um how Anna Dressed in Blood came about, the short stories that I started getting placed, um they started placing when I just let the weirdness go. <laughs> uh, before that, I, I'd been writing a lot of you know literary stuff um, with no paranormal, no supernatural, no fantasy elements. And but I grew up reading fantasy. I grew up on Stephen King. I grew up on um, you know the Never Ending Story and all of that. So I was you know it's it's a little surprising that it took me that long to really integrate it after I'd been exposed to it for that many years but as soon as I did those are the short stories that started being picked up and I decided to when I got home from the course I thought well maybe I should try this at novel length and see what happens and I'd really wanted to play whatever new Silent Hill game was coming out <laughs> right. probably four at the time but nobody would play it with me because it's too scary and since <laughs> it is that scary I don't play it alone so instead I wrote and addressed in blood and that's that's where it came from is I wanted to write something that would let me go all in with blood and guts and I felt I was in the mood for horror um I, I love that you said that uh when when you kind of let your weirdness out that's when your story started resonating with people uh what do you think it is about um us as writers uh you know we we kind of try to try to put on airs uh and say well you know uh this is not acceptable let me try to um make things more palatable for the general audience and, and you wind up squashing who you really are in doing that yeah i don't know um you know maybe when we're young writers and we're starting out we just have to try a lot of different things Throwing, throwing stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Um, and I do, I recommend that to, to young writers to try a whole lot of different stuff, different genres, different styles, different tenses, just to get a feel for everything because, you know, you never know until you've tried it. Uh, what is it about horror uh, and, and the darker fantasy that you love? 
I wish I knew um, one of the first novels, like adult novels. The first adult novel that I ever read was Stephen King's Gerald's Game. Oh, wow. And just, I can't you just jumped right in the deep end. Just didn't you? jumped right into the pool. Uh, and I don't know why that is. My parents are lovely people. I had a really <laughs> well adjusted childhood. Uh, but it's always, I've always been drawn to that. Well, you know, um, you know, people have asked Stephen King, like, what happened in your childhood? What twisted thing happened to you? And, you know, I think he even talks about it in his book on writing. Uh, he was like, I was just a normal kid. You know, it's just, it's just what what comes out, and uh, I've I've thought about that too. And I, you know, I was a a, a pretty well adjusted kid, and, and probably too well adjusted, too <laughs> sheltered. And there's just something freeing about going dark sometimes, and you know, seeing where your imagination can go. And uh, you know, it's it's almost uh, cathartic a little bit. In that yeah. you, know, you get to you know slay dragons that that you never will encounter in life, hopefully, and uh, it, it's this really weird human thing that uh, that we get to play with the darkness in our mind, uh, hopefully to keep us from going there in real life. Well, maybe it is because we're all so well adjusted. Like that darkness is a safe place for us to go to, and if we had had darkness, actual darkness in our childhoods, maybe we wouldn't feel so safe messing around with it. True, true. Um, so tell us a little bit about the story of Anna Dressed in Blood. What, uh, what is the book about? Anna Dressed in Blood is about a 17-year-old ghost hunter named Kaz Lowood. And ghost hunting sort of runs in his family. He has the sacred knife that uh, has the ability to kill the dead. So in Kaz's world, if someone is, say, murdered really badly, um, they may hang around not realizing that they're dead and they may try to, you know, reenact their grisly end upon the living. So when he hears about these kind of stories, he, he travels the country with his mom, who's a kitchen witch, and his cat, who can sniff out spirits. And they put that to rest. You know, he goes and he, he does the hunt and then he moves on. So when he hears about a ghost named Anna Dressed in Blood, who was supposedly murdered on her way to a school dance in 1958. Uh, they like nearly cut her head all the way off. And that's why they, she was wearing this really nice white dress that she'd made herself. And that's why they call her dressed in blood because clearly the dress is basically just made of blood at this point. But she kills anybody who walks into her Victorian, her deserted Victorian home. Um, and so he rolls up there thinking it's going to be just another job. But unfortunately, she's far stronger than anything he's faced. Uh, and, you know, kicks his ass left, right, and sideways, and he has to regroup and come up with a new plan. I love it. And uh, that book went on to be uh, a series. Uh, how many books were in that series? Two. 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 Gotcha. Uh, did you have an agent at the time that you wrote Anna Dressed in Blood? No. Um, Anna Dressed in Blood was the book that got me my agent, and I've had the same agent ever since. Um. It was written originally as a standalone because I, you know, I <laughs> didn't want to get my hopes up considering it would have been the first thing that I'd ever published with a, a large publishing house. So, yeah. How long did it uh, take you to shop that before you landed your agent? Not very long. Um, I have multiple, multiple spreadsheets of agents with many, many marked rejections for my other projects, but... With Anna, it seemed like I just had the right project at the right time, and I was only on submission with her for a couple of weeks before I had two offers for representation, and then I was in the strange position of suddenly having to choose between them, which I was completely unprepared for. Um, yeah, and then it actually it didn't take very long before we had multiple offers on the book from an, uh, an editor or editors too. So it was, you know, right price, right time. Right. Uh, if someone else finds themselves in a similar position where uh, you all of a sudden have a couple of offers that you have to choose between, how do you go about the process of figuring out uh, which, which deal is the one for you? Oh gosh, it's so hard. Um, but it's wonderful. I mean, it's a wonderful situation to be in. So congratulations to those folks. But I, yeah, I, I don't envy being in that position uh, every time. You know, it's, it's really difficult. So 
sometimes you just have to go with your gut. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty good advice. Uh, go with which one feels right and, and who seems to to get the, the feel for what you're doing the best. So uh, go with your gut. Arrange for calls between everybody. Um, definitely, you know, get a feel for what the agent sees for your future. If they think that the book is ready to go on submission now or if they think it needs some editorial work. If they think it needs editorial work, that doesn't necessarily mean they're the wrong choice, but I would get um, some information about what kind of edits that they think are necessary. Um, also ask them about their communication, like how they like to communicate with their authors. You can even ask for references. So if you want, I mean, they will happily, hopefully, if they're a good agent, they'll happily give you names of their other clients and then you can email them or call them and they can ask questions for you if you're comfortable asking them of the agent directly. But honestly, it might come down to like a coin toss because some of these are really, really great and you just can't choose between them. So just go with fate. Right. Right. And you talked about, um, you know, if they thought it needed editorial work, um, that probably is, is a very difficult decision because you need to decide uh, if your book really needs this much work or if they just don't, get you and, and don't quite right. understand your vision for the book. So um, uh, you really need to have the confidence in what you're writing uh, when faced with that decision as well, I would think. Exactly. And I mean, it's, it's, it's so hard to have that much clarity on a project that you're really passionate about as you undoubtedly are with your first book that's getting you the agent. Uh, my agent uh, that I went with, she said, you know, it doesn't really need much editing. We're probably ready to go out, except you need to remove this scene where Anna eats a Belgian waffle because you know, she's dead. <laughs> and I said, Oh yeah. She's like, what did you do that for? I'm like, I was probably hungry, but don't worry. I can pull that right out. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a recurring theme in your writing, uh, food that shows up. Yes. Yeah. I love food. <laughs> That's great. Oh, tell me about the Goddess War uh, series that you wrote. Uh, wh where did where did those books come from? Those came from uh, my love of Greek mythology, in particular the Iliad and the Odyssey. I actually, in my mind, I call them my Iliad fan fiction, and I kind of can't believe anybody let me write them. Um, <laughs> but it's so the Goddess War trilogy is about dying Greek gods, if they had survived to present day and then suddenly discovered that they were dying these horrible, gory deaths that were related to their powers. So, for example, Athena is um, the goddess of wisdom and battle strategy, and her sacred bird is the owl, and she discovers that owl feathers are springing up inside her body and, like, tearing their way through her to the surface, and then she's just got to rip them loose, you know? Like, they're basically turning her into a big feather pillow. And, um, she would like to stop that. Uh, it's it's kind of part of the story is about how an immortal would would deal with being faced with the end of their immortality, and you know it's not well. That's how they deal with it. So she sets off on this quest with her brother Hermes, who is also dying um, from a wasting disease. Like Hermes is the god of thieves; he's extremely fast, um, and it's like his metabolism has sped up to a point that he can't keep up with it anymore no matter how much he eats he just keeps wasting away and wasting away so along their quest they encounter other gods who are dying in various ways and eventually it leads them to uh reincarnated heroes from the trojan war who are living unbeknownst to them just living their lives as regular everyday teenagers but in this war with the gods and the tragedy that's fallen them they have to be kind of woken up and brought back into the fray Nice. Um, what was the, the creative process uh, like? How was it different for you writing this series uh, as opposed to the Anna series uh, where you have, you know, established characters and established mythologies? And of course, you're, you're bending them and molding them to, to your own story. Uh, but what's it like, you know, with an established toolbox like that to begin with? In a way, it made it easier. I mean, there's nothing I hate more than trying to come up with names. And these gods came with names. So, and, you know, powers and rules and um, so much in place. It was also scary 
because people already have their notions of the gods. And if my vision didn't quite gel with theirs, it would throw off their reading experience if I didn't do it well. So um, that was intimidating, but I was so immersed in it. Uh, it actually started, the idea for the Goddess War trilogy actually sprang from a short story, not even a short story, really, it's a vignette. It's just like a vignette on um, three of the goddesses and if they were suddenly dying, that like what their deaths would be. So I, I had an idea of these particular goddesses, and it was, it was Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera, and they were my three main protagonist antagonists, like the center of the goddess war. So just going off of that, I had a, a pretty decent framework for the story because I know how they were dying, and I knew... I, I really went off of their feelings regarding the judgment of Paris and their, their changing alliances and shifting alliances in the Trojan War. Gotcha. Um, how many books were in that series? Three. Three? Three, plus two short stories. So that was fun. Nice. Uh, what was the, the target audience for that series? Um, I think... I, I mean, would I don't know... Would you call it YA? I would call it YA, uh, although they did, they're like, the, it, it might cross over. Um, they were kind of, maybe it's for folks who had read Percy Jackson and then just really liked mythology, but it was, they'd aged up a little bit from Percy Jackson. So, Right. Uh, what are some of the challenges when writing uh, for that age group? And I know that age group is broad. Um, it, when, you're, when you're writing stories that are darker, uh, are there any challenges for uh, when you're writing to that age group? No, I never think about it because I don't, when I'm writing, I don't really write to an age group. I just let the story take over. And the stories that I happen to be writing uh, were kind of catered to or suited to that particular age group just because of the age of the protagonists. Um, but I mean, I don't, I never censor my violence. Um, I've only ever had one line of violence cut and it was just the sound that the entrails made when they hit the floor i mean i don't know why that was the line but that was it they made me cut the sound and um i did have to move one of my f words off the first page but only in the <laughs> only in the uk edition in the united states the f word is still on the first page of antigodis so which is so weird because uh you know uh it, it seems like in the uk they throw that around a whole lot more than we do <laughs> That's so bizarre. It's how weird. Uh, but hey, okay, whatever. Uh, but yeah, well, they just made me move it to like the second page. It was no, it was no big deal. <laughs> you can still keep it. You just got to shift yeah, it, right? Just move it. Well, you know, you don't know what grandmothers are picking it up and and don't want that. You know, when they flip open the book in the bookstore, uh, want right, that to be a deal breaker. Yeah. So yeah, um, the the sound that the entrails made was was that just too visceral for them? Uh, did they? <laughs> Give you any I don't input? know. <laughs> I don't know, but I just I found it so. I mean, I didn't argue. I was just like, sure. I don't. Whatever. I just found it funny that that was that was the thing. I mean, he still gets ripped in half, and the entrails still fall to the floor because where else would they go? They're not going to levitate. But then you know they just fall to the floor silently. You don't hear. <laughs> you don't hear anything. Uh, your books do include uh, quite a bit of violence, and and you don't shy away from depicting the the acts and the the horror of of the thing happening. Uh, why is it important for you uh, to to put a spotlight on it and not just have the violence happen off the page? Well, in the horror novels, particularly, I think it's an essential ingredient. I mean, you don't need you can. You can it can be gratuitous and there can be overkill, so you kind of have to walk a fine line. But if someone's reading a horror novel, they do expect a certain amount of blood. Um, so that was that was an easy decision to make. Plus, that was originally the reason that I wanted to write it anyway, is I'd had a long time without writing any entrails. Um, but so you were due. <laughs> it was due. I was due for entrails. But for Three Dark Crowns, there's not a lot of gore. There are horrible things and, um, you know, acts of, uh, I mean, some people would say abuse or torture, uh, acts of murder. But I, I'm pretty sure that there, well, maybe there is one mention of entrails, but it's very fleeting. Very fleeting. So it just depends on the story. It's what the story calls for. 
Well, speaking of uh, Three Dark Crowns, uh, you shifted gears with this series uh, and and went more epic fantasy. Uh, what was the your decision, or you know, when you, when you finished the other uh, series, were you just itching to write fantasy? Was this something that you had uh, wanted to do for a while? Uh, kind of, what was the motivation to uh, to go this way? No, you know, I'm not one of those writers who has a dozen beautiful, wonderful ideas floating around just to choose from. My ideas show up about every two years, and so I better just go with whatever they are. So in the spring of 2013, I, I was at a book event, and I, I came across a bee swarm, which is just like, I don't know if you've seen one, but just a ball made of 100% bees. And I was very afraid of it, but a beekeeper who happened to be there, just like a superhero whenever I needed them, she said, don't be afraid there's a bee queen, a queen bee in the middle of that ball. And as long as you don't, you know, whack the ball, they won't bother you. They're just going to protect her. And I'm like, why would she be in there? And she's like, well, they're moving to a new hive and that's how they travel, you know, in this form of protection. I'm like, well, why do they need to go to a new hive? So I was obviously just annoying the hell out of this poor beekeeper. And she told me before the queen leaves her hive, she'll take half of her workers. She'll leave half behind and she'll lay four or five queen eggs. Um, and the, the baby queens will hatch out, and they'll just murder each other until one queen bee is left, and she's the one who gets to take over. So the premise behind Three Dark Crowns is in every generation on this magical island, triplet queens are born, and when they turn 16, they've just got to murder each other, and whichever one is strong enough to survive um, gets to be the next queen for the next generation. So... Right after I was driving home from that book event with that bee ball, that's when I started working on Three Dark Crowns. Just It was just that easy and just that random. I have three daughters, and I would never let them read your book. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that, I, I love that, that uh, the, the, the bees uh, kind of you know, launched the story. I, I love how story ideas come from what seems like the most random places, but, uh, you know, it just takes a, a spark or a seed and, you know, the story grows out of it. Uh, how long did you kind of stew on it and, and, and work on it in your mind before the story really started taking form? At least a year. Um, I still had one more book to go in the Goddess War trilogy. And I had to talk to my agent because I, I also had this other book idea that I'd planned on doing. Next. And I heard about both of them, Three Dark Crowns and this other book. And, you know, she listened politely through the first book. And then as soon as I started talking about those three queens, her eyes just like, got you know, that expression, that really wide eyed, like, yeah, you're going to do that one. And I said, well, that one's not quite ready. I think I should get the other one first. So she said, sure, she said, I'll read it. <laughs> so I wrote that other book and she read it and she's like, that's nice. So when are you going to start that Queens book? <laughs> so. I love it. Did you, uh, did you approach the writing of that one different than did you did your previous books? Yes. Um, out of necessity. Like I was, we, this was the first book. Um, I had, I was switching publishers. So I was moving from tour. Uh, and then I was going out, you know, to the great unknown. I didn't know where, if anywhere the book would land. And so we sold this book off a synopsis and 50 pages. Wow. Whereas before I'd always had something complete final. This is what, this is what it is. This is what you get. Everybody knows what we're in for. So that was an interesting experience. Not everybody gets to sell a book on 50 pages and a synopsis. Um, I mean, you <laughs> obviously had, uh, had earned a reputation. Uh, that uh, that allowed publishers to uh, to have the confidence that you could deliver that, I'm sure. I was lucky enough that the Anna Dressed in Blood series did sufficiently well. Um, so people still had some name recognition. And, and yeah, I was, I was able to. And actually, Three Dark Crowns ended up going to auction. It was another auction situation, so multiple offers too. So another tough decision. But okay. I'm happy with the did, did one you, I made. Did you get an offer from Tor? Because uh, how how weird that you know they're they're kind of known for epic fantasy, and then you write an epic fantasy and and switch to a different publisher. Right, they did, and I love Tor. I I really they're fantastic people, and they treated they, they me. They really are. 
so well. Like they treated me like a real rock star from the beginning. Um, and I really loved my editor there and it was really, really hard to walk away. But, um, my agent just felt that the book would fit better with a different publisher and that maybe it was time to see what else was out there. And so, sure. and, 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 and that happens. Uh, you know, that's, that, that's the beauty of publishing, uh, you know, in the, the time and age that we live now is the author really has so many more options. What, uh, what about writing epic fantasy? Um, since you, you were writing in a, uh, in a fantastical world, in, in a fantasy world, as opposed to, uh, you know, this world, uh, but with, uh, with fantasy elements, like in your, your earlier books, uh, mm -hmm. when you're, cre when you're creating a new world from scratch and new mythologies and, and all of that, um, is it harder or more difficult in, uh, in imagining, an, imagining a new series? in a fantasy world? It's both. In a way, it's very freeing because I don't have to study maps anymore. I don't have to route which way my character is going to take to get to school. I don't have to worry if they actually have Cinnabons in Canada, which turns out they don't. So there's a, there's a magical Cinnabon in Girl of Nightmares that doesn't really exist. Um, but it's also kind of daunting. It was the first time that I'd ever created a place from scratch. And yes, I mean, we all, we, they still have the basic tenets of, you know, gravity and people need to eat. I wasn't going that far into, um, science fiction or fantasy. Uh, but I was going into the past. So they, they speak with a different kind of dialect. Um, and that took me several drafts to get down. I couldn't put in any of my Ghostbusters jokes because Ghostbusters don't exist there. Uh, I couldn't even really put in the swear words because they don't swear the same. And it was hard because I'm not a, I'm not an outliner. I don't outline things. I hardly ever know how things are going to end when I start them. Sometimes I don't know until about the midpoint of the book. And so as I was writing, it would always enter the back of my mind. Like, am I writing myself into a corner right now? Because all of these rules I'm going to have to adhere to for the rest of these series. So by setting up the government to work this way, by setting up the religion to work this way, by setting up the line of succession to work this way, we're going to have to obey that forever. And that was a scary thing. So far, it's worked out okay. Um, you, you mentioned something that that uh, that piqued my interest. You said you, that you couldn't even swear the same way. Uh, you know, we we really depend on language. Uh, and the, the commonly accepted language, uh, to convey emotion and frustration and, and different things like that. And if someone stubs their toe and you go, oh, shit, you know, exactly, <laughs> you, you know, exactly what's going on. You, you know what the deal is. Um, how as a writer do you approach, um, you know, handling those situations and, and figuring out the language that's going to convey the same things? It was. Uh, kind of, it was a challenge at times because sometimes, you know, you just say, oh, God. And there is, there's a goddess on the island. It's a matriarchal society and it's a, it's a goddess based religion. So none of the characters would ever say that. But I also have characters coming from a different part of the world and they are more patriarchal with, with a god, more familiar, more similar to what we have here. And they would say it. So, it was kind of, you know, balancing the two. But honestly, once I was into it by a couple of chapters, I'm really lucky in that my characters are usually very strong. They usually have very strong voices. And they just kind of go. The dialogue is some of the easiest. It's definitely the easiest part of the writing. I hardly ever have to revise very much dialogue. So they just kind of take over and, and they follow their own rules. Like that's part of, I think, the subconscious magic of writing. Sometimes they they just work out. You said that you're not uh, much of an outliner, and sometimes you don't even know how the story is going to end. Uh, there's a follow up to Three Dark Crowns. Uh, One Dark Throne is a brand new book that you have out. Uh, how many books do you see in this series? Four. Uh, originally, there were two. After Three Dark Crowns came out, um, it was successful enough. They're going to let me write two more. 
So four, and then there will also be some novellas releasing this winter as eBooks, and then those novellas will be bound up together as a paperback this spring. Ooh, nice, I like that. Um, how, as as someone that doesn't outline, uh, how do you plan for a series like that uh, when you're figuring the story out as you go? It's a very, <laughs> it's not an exact science. Um, I, I wouldn't even say there's really a method. It's once again, you just have this concept and the feeling that there is a story out there in the ether waiting for you to pull it down or waiting for you to dig it up, whichever way you go. Uh, and it's, it's hard to get a general sense of, of how far you think that might take you. So I've never, I sold the Goddess War trilogy based on a, I thought that was a duo as well. And then we figured out that, no, it's probably a trilogy. So sometimes it takes time to get into the writing. And when they, when they let me extend the series, I felt like it would take another duo. I want to do a prequel and then a sequel. And they said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> so I said, well, how about I combine my prequel and my sequel somehow through time jumps because they all relate together. Like it, it all means something in the end. It, it all informs on the present storyline. And they said, okay to that. So now I actually have like a combined prequel sequel and they form the next duo. And the first duo still ends where basically where it always was going to. I didn't just stretch it out because I couldn't by the time uh, we decided to extend uh, one dark throne had already been written and was going into edits. So it was pretty much almost done. So I like to think of it as more of a duo and a duo. So the first two tell the story of like the crowning and the next two will tell the story of the reign. Oh, nice. I, I like the way that worked. Um, the, the new book is One Dark Throne. Where, uh, where does this book take the story? Well, so the premise of the three triplet queens, um, when they turn 16, there's a festival in the spring and after the festival is what it kicks off what they call on the island the Ascension Year. So during that year, they have freedom uh, to take out their sisters, to assassinate their sisters in whatever they, way they see fit. And it, it just, um, so the first book takes you through the kickoff of that Ascension Year, and then One Dark Throne takes you all the way through the rest of it. So all the way to someone wearing a crown, basically. Nice. Um, the, uh, you said that there's, uh, there's some novellas coming out this, uh, this winter. What, what is the writing process like for you when you approach those? Uh, do you approach those differently than you do the full size novels? I do. They're, they're less, they're less of a, I don't quite sigh heavily when I'm in the middle of a novella because they're only 25,000 words, 25, 30,000 words. So, the Three Dark Crowns books have clocked in upwards of 100,000 both times. And when I think about them in comparison, it, they just feel, mentally, they feel very easy. Also, I actually had part of the first one written because the first novella is called The Young Queens, and it's going to tell the story of the queen's birth and the first few years that they spent together before they were separated. So um, I had written that as part of like a first draft from that 50 page proposal that my agent said, no, 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 the story doesn't start here. Move it ahead. You know, the story starts when they're older and I, I agreed, but I still had all that stuff like that, that stuff from when they were kids. So I just integrated that into the young Queens. So the young Queens came together very quickly. And the second novella is actually the story of a queen from history. So a story from like, five, six hundred years before these queens were even born. So that was fun because it's fun. It's It's been fun kind of because in a way they're almost historicals. They're fantasies, but they're almost historicals because I get to jump around so much on the timeline. I love that. And and when you've created the world, there's so much history to explore uh, because when, when something is happening, it, that is a result of something that's happened in the past and uh, it's just almost limitless uh, potential to, to explore why the things in the world are the way they are. That is some of the fun of being a writer, isn't it? 
Like there are yeah. certain things about your world and your characters that only you will ever know that will never make it into the books. It will just be like the background fabric, the fabric that you created out of, but it doesn't really have any place in the story. And I think that's really cool. Yeah. I think that's why, you know, like, um, JK Rowling will, <clears throat> will go on Twitter and, you know, just drop some random bomb about, you know, th <laughs> this thing happened in the world. And you're like, what? I, you know, it's like, she just can't just, I, I can't hold on to this any longer. I've got to, you know, just throw it out there. Exactly. And, you know, then we're happy that we know, but it's like, oh, I would have liked to see it. But if you think about it, there was so much going on in those Harry Potter books. Like, really, would you have had time to wedge much more in? No, they were perfect just as as they were. Um, and, uh, just like, uh, three dark crowns and one dark throne are absolutely perfect. These books are so engaging. Um, I, I could not, when I first picked up three dark crowns, I couldn't put it down. I was like, this is the most innovative thing I've read in quite a while. So, um, I'm a big fan and uh, I love what you do. Um, thank you for coming on the show, Kendara. Thank you so much for reading it. I'm so happy you liked it. Um, if people are not familiar with your work, where can they find you online if they want to dig into all the stuff that you do? Oh, it's really easy. Um, I'm on Twitter at Kendara Blake. I'm on Facebook at Kendara Blake. I'm on Instagram at Kendara Blake. And my website is KendaraBlake.com. So as long as they know my name, they can find me anywhere. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show, Kendara. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. A man approached with a bloody hatchet. Do you kids belong here? He said. Yes, sir. We're volunteers, sir. I'm Joey, and that's no time for biographies. What you got? Costume donations from the Sleepy Hollow Theater Department, Joey said breathlessly. That's sweet, but you're on the wrong side of the mill pond. That way, past the corn maze and behind Ichabod Schoolhouse, got it? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. It's an honor, sir. The man shouldered his hatchet and walked away. He had splashes of blood on his back. You're insane, said Jason. Insane? Look at this. This is live theater. An enormous crew crawled over the manor grounds. The preparations must have been going on for months. The handful of milled buildings had been dressed with assorted horrors and surprises. Corpses were swung from hangman's ropes. Jail doors were hung with stumps. Torsos were slung on bloody spikes, and heads peered from pikes. Tables groaned beneath gore and candles and smoking censers. A spattered priest sharpened his sword on a 17th century grinding wheel. Lanterns on hooks and lengths of sailing rope traced the path for visitors, leading them around the mill pond and through the buildings, into the mill house and newer structures, out again, and into a fluttering white circus tent. A pumpkin-headed scarecrow menaced the boys, gleeful for a second chance at a child of Ichabod Crane. Joey sighed. Live theater is where I belong. When they entered the big tent, a half-dozen monsters turned to look at them, Monsters with horns and fangs and saucer eyes, with melting, rotted flesh. The monsters wore makeup bibs, t-shirts, and sweatpants. A woman in a nun's habit bared jagged teeth. Joey and Jason carried their boxes past rows of severed heads, masks, and prosthetics, pinned or taped to wig dummies, powdered wigs, witches' brooms, angel wings, fake fingernails, false fangs, hollow-eyed mannequins of children— Widow's weeds, red coat uniforms, shawls, tricorn hats, a cannon on rollers, four racks of colonial dresses, a shelf of candles, and a rotted corpse in polystyrene. They ogled the collection with wonder. They were on the inside. The scarers, not the scarees. A figure stood waiting in the center of the dressing room, admiring itself in the reflection of three makeup mirrors. As they entered, it whipped about and snarled. Jason and Joey screamed and fell backwards onto the floor. A massive beast with two curling ram's horns, withered red skin, and eyes blazing from beneath a thick ridge of brow loomed over them with claws raised. Boo, you pussies, said Satan. Eddie, said Joey, you're the devil, king of darkness himself. 
But that's the biggest role. Except for the horseman. I'm only a red coat after two callbacks, and you're... You're non-equity. That's because you couldn't scare shit. He took a step forward and they cringed. Even in a dressing gown and boxer shorts, he was a scary devil. Can you do this? He locked eyes with Joey, fixing him with an imperious glare. Joey couldn't hold eye contact and looked away. Can you? Eddie said, and he turned the same withering spotlight on Jason. I will not blink, those yellow eyes snarled. Jason could feel the hatred and contempt there. He tried to hold the gaze, but his eyes began to water. Crying already? You know you got no chance, said the yellow eyes. Evil wins in the end. Evil always wins. You know why? Because evil lifts at four in the morning. Evil eats raw egg and whey protein and bloody hearts. Evil shoots itself full of anabolic steroids and benches three times its body weight while good wastes the day in some library. Satan is coming for you, Jason Crane, with an army of jocks at my command, you pathetic nerd. You loser. You nothing. You better run when the bell rings, kid, because we are going to kick your ass after school. Jason blinked. Satan broke into a triumphant sneer. And the boys had to admit that if intimidation was an acting talent, Eddie Martinez was the Sir Lawrence Olivier of Horseman's Hollow. <laughs>